Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I cannot hear any of you. I got you, Dave. All right. Yay. And uh, Betsy, I hope you can hear. I don't see a microphone next to your name, so I'm guessing that uh, you don't have a mic. Oh, nope. Now I see a microphone. Can you Hi, hear David. Me? Hi, David. It's Betsy. Hi. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Excellent. All right. So I did get a text from one person who I think meant to say that he's going to be uh, da, 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 will be late. Oh, so I don't know how late late is, so I'm not going to wait for him. Um, I, uh, I I like to start promptly whenever I can. Uh, I was intending to have some face cam so that my my face could be a part of this, but uh, my camera's not participating, so it's not going to be a part of this today. Um, let me do one last push, and we will be ready to go. Um, zero. Yeah, that was what I wanted. All right. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Actually, you know what? I could be showing you guys this. I'll, I'll get right to you. Actually, let me go ahead and just share this. So Betsy, did you decide to invite your uh, coworker or no? I did, and he said he was going to join, so. Okay, well, hopefully hopefully he does. We'll see. Yeah, he's awesome. So thanks for that. My pleasure. I'm hoping that he's um, uh, interested, and then he will continue after this. So that's that's my hope. That would be a blast. Uh, mm -hmm. these, these things are very much the more the merrier, um, the more uh, the more novices and experts we get in the same room, the better the knowledge sharing goes. Um, we get better questions. Uh, novices bring their fresh perspective and experts bring their, um, their esoteric tricks. Yes. And so, so, so we end up doing things more logically because the novices point out that, well, that's really dumb. I don't know why you do it that way. And, um, and then veterans either have to justify it or, or give up the practice, which is good. And, um, uh, and then veterans trading war stories is always fun, um, as long as it doesn't go on too long. <laughs> All right. So uh, you should be seeing a bash screen now, right? Correct. Yay. All right. So I'm just going to uh, do one last push, like I said. Um, I think I have a... A nice commit message somewhere back here. This is not at all the commit message that I wanted. Um, so this is better materials. Whoops. All right, let's take a look at the outline. Uh, my goal is to talk until about 7.15, and then to switch to a demo and do a demo for about 15 minutes, and then have you guys do programming for 15 or 20 minutes, and then hopefully somebody will be willing to share their screen, hopefully everyone will be willing to share their screen, and show what they've learned or accomplished. Let's see how this goes. This by that, by the way, is theoretically the way that I teach every class. Only I don't actually do it. I take great liberties from my uh, my supposed method. Um, so let's have a talk about what Bash is first. What is Bash? 
Who's here? Who's who's here and knows what Bash is before I even start? The born again shall. That's good. That's the expansion of the acronym. And hey, hi, Rich. Well, he'll be here eventually, or his his audio will kick in eventually. Hi, Rich. Hi, Rich. Okay, I'm done saying hi, Rich. We're going to move on to the next thing. So, uh, Bash expands out to the Born Again shell. Um, the uh, Jeff Hamer is my Bash teacher. He's the one that helped me to become a lot smarter with how I do Bash. And he says that Bash is the user's interface to the operating system which seems like a pretty reasonable definition for it. Um, it's a great place to launch jobs and shut jobs down. Uh, we're not gonna, at least not in this session, we're not gonna talk about job control um, because that's more interactive than scripting. And the focus of this class is to do scripting. Um, although uh, if, you don't, if you aren't familiar with Bash's job control functions, I uh, highly recommend that you take a side note and explore them a bit. Uh, being able to suspend and resume jobs in the background is uh, great, good fun, and allows you to get more out of each shell window. Why would a person choose Bash over, a per, uh, over any other shell? I'm going to give my reasons, um, and the, uh, uh, my reasons in, are uh, that Bash is very programmable. I love that. I love that I have access to variables. I love that I have access to a whole bunch of different um, uh, decision-making architectures and looping constructs and subshell constructs and uh, expression compounding constructs, plus a massive set of GNU utilities that I can use to extend the shell itself. Uh, and it's very easy to call them and construct them into a pipeline. Um, I got the question as we were planning on bash programming, uh, how am I gonna keep it purely about bash programming? And my answer was, I'm not gonna keep it purely about bash programming. What I'm going to try to do is teach a class that is generally useful for a person that is programming bash on a Linux box I'm not going to teach you, for example, string processing with Bash. I'm going to take a cheap advantage of the most popular patterns with Bach and Set, and maybe Perl, but probably not. Um, and then I'm going to put those things into a pipeline because I believe that that's the correct way to use Bash. Now. Uh, if you end up with performance issues, then you will need to switch to Bash's internal uh, features for that kind of stuff. Um, oh, you know what? You guys can't actually see my outline right now. Let me pull that up. I, sh I forgot that I had shared a window with you and not a, whoops. I forgot that I had shared a window with you and not my whole desktop. So we've talked about what Bash is, and we've talked about why choose Bash. What are, before we leave the talk section and dive into the demo, um, what are some of the uh, other competitors for Bash? What are other shells that you're familiar with? Born shell. Born shell, uh, and its, it's binary is SH, right? No, I actually brought up corn shell. Oh, corn shell. Sorry, yeah. it's it's binary is KSH, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have a different answer? Corn shell is my experience, my my shell of choice. Okay, and yeah. it's binary is KSH. Anyone Correct. else? Yeah. Anyone else have a favorite shell that isn't Bash, or or just have a shell that they're highly familiar with that isn't Bash? I use uh, ZSH. Who was that? This is Mike. Hi, Mike. I use Z shell. Oh, very good. 
So who was it that said? Uh, I, I keep talking, Dave. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. No, no, it's good. It's good. Um, that's fine. Um, all right. So anyone else? Does anybody else have a shell that they like a lot or that uh, they're highly familiar with? Okay. Um, I'll mention a few others so that if you're interested in shopping shells, um, you can go ahead and try them. Um, I'll, I'll mention first off that I haven't used any shell on Windows in a long time. Um, so I hear that PowerShell is amazing. I don't know what its binary is. I don't know what it does. I don't know what its capabilities are. I do know that P-A-S-H, PASH, is supposed to be a PowerShell compliant shell for Linux. So there's that. Um, Command.com is the shell for DOS. CMD.exe is the shell for all flavors of Windows NT, which is basically everything since Windows XP um, and Windows NT4. Uh, K shell, uh, C shell, for Linux and other free operating systems as have already been mentioned. Uh, the one that hasn't been mentioned yet is Fish. Uh, if you're in the mood to shop around for shells and try other shells that might be uh, powerful and friendly, try the friendly interactive shell. I have a couple of friends that absolutely swear by it and, and say that it is lovable and uh, uh, great. Anybody have any quick questions before we move from talking into demonstrating? Okay, uh, I'm gonna mention that I am an interactive shell programmer, which means that I generally write my programs on the command line first, and then I pump them into a shell script when they get beyond five or six lines. That makes my initial few line development much, much faster, and it allows me to develop iteratively, um, which uh, uh, my teacher, again, um, Jeff Hamer, calls alluvial programming. And then I, I combine alluvial programming with stupid history tricks because alluvial refers to the layers of dirt that have accumulated over history. And my stupid history tricks are what allow me to extract my program back from the layers of history. So we're going to write uh, two programs to, to, tonight. Um, I'm going to write two programs in front of you, I hope. Um, the first one is, what is the most popular shell on this system? This is a lot easier than the other one, and it, uh, it brings in a lot fewer tools. and um, it's just a simple pipeline. So if I wanted to figure out what the most popular shell on my system is, I would have to figure out, or I'd have to take a look at the place where people store their favorite shells, which is Etsy Password. So now that I have an idea of what Etsy Password's layout is, and I can never remember exactly how many fields it has, I know that the shell is stored here in this rightmost um, field. And that field is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven fields, uh, it's the seventh field over and that the fields are delimited by colons. So I'm gonna use cut to grab field seven where the fields are delimited by colons. And sure enough, that got me just the shells. Well, I need to figure out which one of those shells occurs most frequently. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to do a sorted, sorted, not sorted, but sorted count. So I'm going to start with a sort. Now that I've got a sorted list, I can count the number of times that each item in that, uh, in that list occurred. Oops, that's not what I meant. I meant sort dash C. No, unique dash C, thank you. I was thinking my own brain. I like to thank it when it works. 
All right, so now I have an idea how popular each of the shells is, but I don't have an answer to my actual question. My actual question is, which shell is the most popular? Now, with your human level of creativity, by using your powers of inference, you're able to figure out that that's been false. But what if I want the computer to tell me that and only that? Now I've got two more steps that I need to go through. So the first thing I'm gonna do is sort that list by number. So now I've got the most popular shell at the bottom. And now I have the most popular shell all by itself, but I have some useless information there and that's the number that, that maps to its popularity. So in order to get rid of that, I'm gonna use a quick awk one-liner. And the awk one-liner is gonna go like this, print dollar two. So print only the second field of that bit. And so I can now see that the most popular shell on this system across these users is been false. Now, if I had a whole bunch of real users, then I would be able to um, get more popularity on bin bash, bin corn shell, bin seashell, uh, maybe fish and ZSH. But I don't have that on this system. If I wanted to suppress bin false, I would have to suppress it manually and say, um, ignore bin false and go to the next one. Um, and I could do that by filtering it out with grep-v. Um, so let's see, I'm just gonna add a quick filter that says grep-v. Uh, then false. So I should come back with only the things that aren't been false and I get back user s bin no login, which is still not a human shell, and I know that, so I'm going to get rid of that too, and I'm gonna to try to do it with a regex, wish me luck. User, user, wow, David, s bin no login. Uh, now that got me to the most popular user shell, right? Uh, because all I did was uh, get rid of bin falses and s bin no logins. But I'm not really sure that, I, that that's all I got rid of. So I'm gonna really quickly take a look at this output and notice that every, uh, that it did get rid of user s bin no login. Actually, I could have gotten rid of user s bin no login and s bin no login in one shot. Um, but I got back only the user shells on the system, which is what I wanted. So this, this alluvial program, this thing that I wrote kind of recursively, seems to have done exactly what I want to. So we've got an answer to uh, the first challenge. The second challenge is to say hello to a user whose name might be Bob and ask him if he wants to play a game. So let's go back to this. All right, second, second example of alluvial programming is this one. What's the most, oh, uh, sorry is, hello, Bob, would you like to play a game? This one's gonna be a little bit harder. Uh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna continue to try to go kind of quick because I want to let you guys try this stuff and show you that there is an answer file available for you. Um, and uh, so let's, let's move on. Now we're gonna get into some variables and some input and more than just pipeline and output from programs. We're gonna start generating our own uh, output. So the first thing is 
generating a little output. The first basic program for every for every language is hello world. Uh, the way that you write hello world in bash is that. And let's get a let's add a variable to it. We'll set greeting. We'll say that the greeting is hello. And we'll change this out to greeting. So now I've got hello world with a variable. But that's not where I wanted the variable. I wanted the variable in the name. So I'm going to set name is David and then greet by name. So now I've got just, just a quick extension there, but what I really want is to ask the user what their name is. So for that, I'm gonna need something that can give me some input. I'm gonna use the read utility to ask the user, what is your name? I'm not gonna ask them about their quest or their favorite color or the capital of Assyria in this program, but I might in later programs. So, uh, and I've forgotten to store it in a variable, so that's, that's gonna be a wasted run. Um, to store it in a variable, just give the name of the variable that you want to store the read in. I need to change it, because otherwise I don't know whether I've got my old one or my new one. Um, you can hit tab when you've typed part of the name of a variable. So what I did here was uh, N and then tab. And I can see that name is equal to Bob. So now I can put these little bits of program together. Uh, so greeting equals hello. Um, and then this read statement here to define that one. And then finally the echo. And what is your name? Bob. So now I've got hello, Bob. Now I want to ask Bob, do you want to play a game? How might I ask Bob if he wants to play a game? I might use what utility? Echo. I might use Echo to ask him how he wants to play a game. How would I record his answer? Read. read. I might use the read utility. Very good. Okay. So I'm going to use the read utility again. I want to capture this time, I just want to capture one character. So I'm going to use N1 to capture one character. And I'm going to record that in answer. So I just read one character from the keyboard, um, and it and it actually does rec uh, read only one character in return. You don't have to hit return; um, it returns automatically. But it does this nasty thing where it has the output of the input that I generated, and then it gives my prompt right after that. So I like to chain it with an empty echo to get rid of that garbage there. So you can see that I'm picking up one character with this read statement. So I'm going to prompt Bob or whoever's operating the console again. Would you like to play a game? And I'm, I'm going to pull back uh, one character and I'm gonna store that character in a variable named answer. Would you like to play a game? Why? All right, now if I echo answer, I should come back with why, right? If I rerun that little program and answer it N and echo answer again, now the value of answer is N. What if, it, what if they answer with something other than Y or N? 
I probably want to send them back to the question, but I'm not going to go into that today. I'll I'll come back to that and we'll um, we'll do that maybe maybe when we write scripts. Uh, and we're going to be writing scripts in hopefully five, about five minutes. This is where we do stupid shell tricks. Let's say that I want to get back to my what is the most popular shell on this system program. Control R allows me to reverse intelligence search for a pattern through my shell history. I hit Control R, I type some pattern like count, uh, and I come up with DD. That's not what I want, obviously. Um, I think I wanted maybe unique. How about unique? Oh, look, there's my program. So does that work the way that I wanted it to? It still does work the way that I wanted it to. So now I can grab this and turn it into a shell script. Copy and I can say uh, most popular shell and drop that stuff in there. I hit I to go into insert mode and then drop that stuff in there. So all I did there was just grab that line out of history and drop it into that file. So if I cat that file, you'll see that it's just that, that just that one line and I can feed it to a new subshell by doing this. So I've run my program without it even being a program. What if I want it to be a program? We're going to come back to that. Um, I want to, I want to do one more stupid bash trick um, or one more stupid history trick. Uh, I want to talk about uh, history length and where your history is stored. And I also want to show you a cool way to turn shell history into a program without having to do a lot of extra work. Um, it, when, it's, when it's more than just a one-liner. Uh, so first of all, the amount of history that's available to a shell session is stored in hist. There it is. I knew it was stored in something. I just couldn't remember what. Wow. I can't type. I can't type and talk, and I especially can't type and talk when um, when there's an audience. Uh, but I'm doing my best. Okay, so hist size is the variable that controls how much history is available to a given session. Hist file size determines how much history gets stored in the history file. And then hist file and hist control and hist command modify uh, when and what to store. I'm not gonna get into those. I recommend setting hist file size very large and hist size to something moderate. This will give you a fast interactive uh, shell session and give you a lot of history to work from when you, um, when you are doing bash programming. Um, so finally, the file in which your stuff is stored is in your home folder and its name is bash underscore history. There are two other files that you're interested in in their bash RC, which configures your shell session um, with aliases and your preferences. Uh, we'll talk about uh, setting prompts in later sessions and stuff like that. Um, and bash RC is also where you would control the values of the hist file size and hist size variables. What else did I want to cover? That's all that I wanted to cover here. Let's go into turning those interactive programs that I wrote into actual program programs. You saw how I took one line and put it into a file 
and then I was able to feed that file into a new copy of Bash. So that's one way to do it. A better way to do it and a way that you're going to want to use for programs that you're going to want to use for a long time or programs that are going to accomplish long complex tasks is to make them cautious uh, so that they won't tolerate errors or unset variables and uh, and you're going to want to copy them in but I always start with my history so let me show you a cool trick this does require that you have a this does require that you have a Linux GUI or that you can do the same thing on a Windows GUI. I know you can do the same thing on a Mac GUI. I just don't know what the, um, what the special key is. If you happen to be on a, uh, lucky enough to be on a Linux box, you can do this the same way that I'm doing it. History bar less brings me up into a browsable copy of my currently loaded command history. I type capital G, that takes me to the very end of it. So this is the most recent stuff. And this is the stuff that I want to turn into a program. So now I'm going to hold my control key while I grab all of the things that are related to the program that I want to write. Here they are. So I want to write that Hello Bob program. All right, and we're going to start the Hello Bob. Uh, once again, I've started an editor, and now I'm in insert mode. Uh, if you prefer, you can use Atom or Notepad or Gedit or whatever editor you like best. Um, I just happen to be using Vim because I'm comfortable with it and I'm sitting at a command line. So I want to get to the beginning, the actual beginning of the program. All right, and the actual beginning of the program is not echo greeting name, it's this here. Pick up uh, what is your name? There's the name right there. Uh, I need to set the greeting. Here's the greeting. I'm going to set that at the beginning. Shift P uh, pastes before the current line. Um, so I got the greeting. Whoops. I got the greeting. And I got the read. And I don't need to do any chaining. Now I need to get the, would you like to play a game? That gets me the, would you like to play a game? And that echoes the answer. So let's find out if this works. Because I did just copy a whole bunch of lines out of my history and into the hello, Bob. Let's see if it works. What is your name? My name actually is David. Hello, David, would you like to play a game? Yes, I would. There we go, so that much worked. That's, a, that's pretty basic. I wanna do one more thing uh, with, these, with these two programs that I've written. Um, Hello, Bob, and Most Popular Shell. I wanna do uh, actually two more things before we leave these. Um, make it three. First of all, I want to make them executable so that I don't have to feed them into a shell um, manually. So hello, Bob, and most popular shell. Let's make them executable and find out if that worked. It probably did, look at that. So now they're, now they're programs. So now I can run hello, Bob. Um, so that's, that's actually kind of ugly, the fact that I'm running shell script against a shell without telling it which shell I want to invoke. I encourage you to always start your programs with a shebang. And what Jeff Hamer taught me 
was to start it with shebang and make it cautious. Uh, and the way that I do that, I'll show you first in Hello Bob, and then I'll show you again in <clears throat> in the other one. So first, I want to tell it what my interpreter is, so that in case my programs aren't, um, I'm doing this wrong. Hash bang. There we go. Um, shebang. <clears throat> If my program isn't compatible with K-Shell or Corn Shell or Born Shell, I don't want them accidentally invoked in some other shell. I want to make sure that I always control the shell that my program runs in. So uh, the way that I do that is by starting it out with a shebang. And then the switches that I always use are EU. If you're in debugging mode, if your program has a problem and you want it to generate as much output as possible, add X. X will show you every level of, of interpolation that your program goes through in order to evaluate a particular expression. But it is gross, a, a gross level of output. Um, EU are switches that you can use all the time. E makes the program intolerant of errors so that anything that exits one, you either have to handle that error or it'll crash your program, which is a good thing. Um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a quick horror story. I had a program that was set to clean data out of a directory that uh, would get credit up. So one, so I, my program was go into that directory and delete everything over a week old. Well, my program was optimistic instead of being cautious like this one is. And one day it went to descend into that directory and that directory wasn't there. So it deleted everything out of my home directory that was over a week old. That was uncomfortable because I have some data that's over a week old that I still value. Um, the next switch, the U switch, makes the system intolerant of unset variables. So this is useful where you want to, let's say you want to chop off a particular directory uh, and maybe it's in slash USR. <clears throat> if you feed it is slash USR some variable name, but you misspell the variable name and you're not intolerant of unset variables, you'll accidentally chop off slash USR instead of slash USR, whatever the variable name was. So this U makes your program be intolerant of that unplanned condition. Uh, so it will help you to notice when you misspell a variable name. So both the programs, um, I think, are doing their shell now. Nope, I forgot to do it on most popular shells, so I'm going to do it one more time on this one. It's a uh, shebang bin, oops, bash dash e u. So now, I don't have to feed it into a shell or optimistically run it without saying which shell I want to run it in. I can run it, run it confidently, knowing that it's going to execute in the shell that I want and it's going to run cautiously. So Hello Bob seems to still work. I want to add one more thing to Hello Bob and then I'm going to open the lab and I'm going to have you guys write these programs, um, and I'll give you the URL of my solutions in case you want to do some copying and pasting. One more thing in the Hello Bob. Um, we're going to evaluate the operator's answer using a regex. We're going to say if the answer matches the regex, 
Y or capital Y and say that the answer is yes like. And if it's not, then it's not. We can expand on that later to have it, uh, to turn that into a function, which would be, do you want to continue and make that very generic? Um, let's try running hello, Bob, and see if this works. This time I'll say my name is Wilson. It says, hello, Wilson, would you like to play a game? And I say H, and it says, your answer is not yes-like. If I want to set a default, I'm going to do one more, one more, more enhancement. And uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I'll we'll do that in a further session. One of the things that I like to catch in my prompts like this is I like to let the user just hit enter or space, and I like to detect those as matching whichever is the default condition. And the way that I show the default condition is to ask the user some question, and then I show them what the default answer is by capitalizing it. So this would be, um, the default would be N in this case. <clears throat> so if I showed the user this, then I would also accept enter or spacebar as an N. All right, I'm going to put my answers in the Bash Programming Git repository so that you guys can look at them, and then I will show you the URL for that repository. All right, you will be able to find uh, the files, all the files that I've created at that URL. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask for questions and then I'm going to ask you guys to write some programs using what you've learned today, even if it's just a simple hello world, at least write one program and then in about 10 minutes, I will ask for one or two or three people to share a program demonstrating one of the things that they learned today. My hope is that even though we've got now five people listening to the call and some of them are pretty experienced, that everybody got something out of today's class. And I'd love for you to show that by showing your program. Um, so I hope that uh, even the, the, the new people got something out of it and even the old people learned at least one new thing today. Uh, so we're going to take a, we're going to take 10 minutes, write some programs, and then hopefully uh, some one or two or three people will be willing to share. Any questions? Okay, I will ask for shares at 755. If you have questions as you're programming, I will be listening. So feel free to go ahead and shout out anytime you want. I think I'll put this URL in the chat window.
Five more minutes.
Quiet, dog. Got a class going on here. Folks trying to concentrate. Okay, folks, uh, that ends the lab portion and takes us to the share portion. Um, <clears throat> looks like we still have enough people left that they might have something interesting to show. So uh, hopefully someone will show something. Who wants to show something? Show me that you learned something. Otherwise, I will become sad and quit teaching. That's not true. I will assume that you're sitting in a library and can't talk.
Dave, I got some scripts I can show if nobody else uh, volunteers. Did you learn anything tonight? Yes. Show that. Well, the part I learned is very short. Okay. So perfect. <laughs> uh, so, do you want me to share my screen? Yes, please. I will stop sharing mine. I, I think you're not allowed to clobber me. Oh, you know what, Dave? I'm not allowed to share, man. I can't do it using Wayland. Oh, supports X11 only. Oh, dar. Uh. <sighs> Been defeated. Uh, paste it into the chat. We'll have to just call it. Uh, we'll, we'll call it good. Paste it into the chat. All right. Very good. And which one of these should I be looking at? I'm sorry, Dave. Hold on. I didn't uh, submit it to the Git repo yet. So give me 30 seconds. Nice. That's cool, Matt James. EUO pipe fail. Hey, Dave, you can look at the SSL check one. All right. SSL check. Uh, oops. I don't know why I set that alarm. Um, Cool. So, uh, Bashi, you, I'm guessing? Yep. <laughs> cool. Cool. All right. And there's also another one I sometimes use. I believe it's a minus X. It's for when I step through the script. Yep. Yep. Debugger mode. Noisy, noisy debugger mode. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so uh, we've heard from Matt and we've heard from Mike. Uh, Eric Lido, did you learn anything tonight? And am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, absolutely, David. I got uh, quite a few things. I use very fairly basic bash scripting, and so there are quite a few things that I got out of it. So I didn't have a chance to go and put a script together, but um, I definitely have some notes taken. Excellent. What's the what's one thing that you remember from tonight? Well, the, the command history. I wasn't familiar with that. Excellent. All right, great. Uh, so everybody learned something. Um, did uh, did you have fun? Somebody Absolutely. said yes. All right, very good. Uh, then for me, if you learned something and you had fun, uh, that's a successful lesson. Um, we will be starting the uh, paid lessons. This one has been a freebie. It's been my pleasure to, to put it on. Um, no, no tip jar for this one, uh, but uh, there will be paid lessons uh, starting on uh, April. What is it? Does anybody have the date handy of the, the first date of the real class? April something, Wednesday, April 18th. Does that sound right? I think it's uh, Wednesday, April 18th is when we're starting the four session um, paid class that'll be 128 bucks. I hope that uh, some one or more of you are interested in that. Uh, otherwise, God bless. It's been a pleasure to uh, learn with you. Have a good night.